Hello and welcome to Cider Chat. My name is Rhea Wincaller and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. This is episode 178. Okay, now if you aren't familiar with that little bit of music there, well that is from a new song that I wrote. And that's my cousin Jay there playing. Uh, the song is called We Like Cider. And the full version is going to be at the very tail end of this here episode. So if you want to listen to that, you could wait till the end or you could just scroll forward and hear it. A shorter version is now up on the YouTube channel, the Cider Chat YouTube channel. And you can see a little video with photos of uh, makers and people involved in the cider scene from around the world. So you can check that out at the Cider Chat YouTube channel. This week's episode, uh, if you're not familiar with how Cider Chat is set up, what I usually have is a feature presentation. And this one is rather unique. See, classically, we're talking about what's in our glass, uh, how that cider was made from the ground up and the maker's story. And we will continue doing that. There's so many stories to be told, no doubt. But this week, we're taking a little bit of a detour. Uh, And maybe it might help you understand why when I'm leading a cider tour, it's one part focus of the cider in the glass, but a big part of the people involved in the community. And that's a what the entire trip to Normandy, France is that we're doing this coming September is one part tours and tasting and another part sightseeing. And as in last year's tour and this year's tour, we will be visiting a cemetery, which is not what folks normally have on their to-do list when they're going on holiday. But if you are going to Normandy you would do a disservice to yourself, I believe, if you didn't have that on your itinerary because it creates an understanding of the culture of that region at a level that really brings you deeper into that glass and appreciation for what was preserved for all of us today. So stay tuned for that. That'll be coming up with the feature chat. I'll talk more. But when I come back, I want to talk about a little bit of a conversation that's going to be coming up mid-May and something that you should also put on your to-do list. There's a reason why we do it like this. There's a reason why we do it like this. Yes, there is. There's a reason why we drink it like this. Yes, there is. There's a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we do it like this and why we drink it like this. The short answer is we like cider. No apologies, no regrets. That's all that needs to be said is we like cider. And we take it from there, don't we? (laughs) Hey, look, coming up on a not so distant episode, we're going to have both Susanna and James Forbes. They are in cahoots, you might say, in the best of way. Uh, They have their cidery based in the UK called Little Pomona. And Susanna Forbes, she is not new to this libations world by any means. Uh, You might have heard about her as at Drink Britain. And I'm going to recommend that you start following her Twitter feed now, at Drink Britain and at Little Pomona. Because later in May, I'm going to be publishing an episode that I recorded with she and James back at CiderCon 2019. And we're going to be putting out a tweet. And if you retweet that, you get put into a, a I don't know, a, a running 
to get a free copy of the Cider Insider. Now, what is the Cider Insider? It is a book that Susanna wrote, and it covers a hundred fantastic ciders from over 35 regions around the world that you want to get on your to-do list now to, to hunt it down because these ciders, they may not be always available. And more importantly, you really want to see the way this gal writes. Uh, she kind of brings you into that bottle and lets your appetite just mm, get stoked to pursue that bottle. I mean, that, that's part of the hunt here, right? It's not just sitting in your little armchair saying, do 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 waiting for a cider. Maybe my friend will bring me over cider. No, 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 no. The part of the fun is going out and finding it, uh, maybe perhaps meeting the makers, and then bringing that bottle home. So the Cider Insider, we're going to be talking about that on this here uh, episode coming up sometime in mid-May. And get on Twitter now, because we're going to be doing this as a Twitter fun, fun, dandy little thing to get your own little free copy of the book. And uh, there'll be more details as we, r we run along. We're kind of working out exactly what you'll have to retweet, but it's going to be easy. So all you need to do is, if you don't have a Twitter feed now, sign up. Twitter's a good thing to have anyways. Um, it's, sometimes you get like instant news. So even if it's not cider related, it keeps you in touch uh, for the daily newest breaking news around the world. So that should be kind of enticing if you like to stay on the cutting edge of the world around you, which frankly, I imagine if you're listening to a podcast, you're probably that kind of person to begin with. So there you go. So you follow her at Drink Britain, at Little Pomona, and certainly make sure that you're following this here podcast. It's at Cider Chat. If you've been listening to Cider Chat for a while and have perused the, the archives of episodes from countries all around the world, it might be surprising for you to hear that most of my actual travels have been very monoculture, meaning that I predominantly have been in North America, enjoying the sights and people and sounds and food and libations of this region of the world that I live in. It wasn't until only recently, really starting in 2008, that my reach became a little bit broader and I had my first opportunity ever to go across the Atlantic Ocean into Western Europe. Most of the time I was in the Netherlands because that's where work took me. And in those travels, I started getting a sense of the magnitude and effect of World War II on the people and the countries that I was visiting. There is something to be said when you are just doing a casual walk in the woods, as I would often do along the border of the Netherlands and Belgium, along a bike trail, and then come upon an area where there were these giant concrete barriers that I then later found out were set up to deter tanks from crossing over the land. The gut feeling in my stomach is just, it still remains here today as I begin talking about it. I just can be taken right back to that moment. I'm like, holy cow, like this was the reality for the people, the culture in this area. I was only in one region of Western Europe and able to see these World War II remnants everywhere, such as German bunkers in the most uncanny spots out in the middle of a field, or just last year walking around the harbor in Flushing in the Netherlands, uh, an area that I've been in for many years now. And for the first time, all of a sudden, boom, out of nowhere, seeing these German bunkers that I never noticed before. Because really, in my mind's eye, I wasn't used to seeing that. It was almost incongruent. It didn't make sense to see that in the landscape. What this has done for me is is kind of one part a historical journey, like, wow, you know, World War II, that was quite the battle. But the other piece is a cultural journey, understanding the people who live there each day, seeing that, the changes over time, the impact of that war on them, their families, 
and their society and communities and how they were able to persevere and go forward. Uh, frankly, the fact that we are able to keep on moving forward out of any war around the world is just speaks volumes of who we are as humans and our tenacity and ability to keep rising up from the ashes. It's really overwhelming. And what the heck does that do for me and you and Cider? Well, for me, it is not just what is in the cup. Cider wouldn't get to the cup if it wasn't for the people. In the U.S., we, we thought we were kind of overwhelmed by prohibition and the tearing down of cider trees. Just imagine being in Western Europe and having these giant tanks, this artillery, this like airstrikes coming into the fields and farms. I think it's kind of like the human condition to want to imagine the best circumstances out of the worst situation. And so we kind of romanticize, oh, those apple trees in Normandy or even England must be like hundreds of years old. Well, yes, uh, probably in the areas where there wasn't bombing and tanks rolling through, you, you will find old apple trees. But some of those apple orchards are more recently planted in the past 75 years. And so they don't have those ancient artifacts uh, in the lower region of Normandy that was still uh, overwhelmed by the war, you will find those ancient pear trees, the 300-year-old pear trees that survived. And sometimes they're just like one out in the middle of the field or, you know, some here or scattered. World War II ended in 1945. That's 74 years ago. Now, in France, uh, in Normandy, which was D-Day, that was like the huge battle where the Allied forces landed to push back the German occupiers. Those farmers coming out of that scene, they might have lost their whole orchard. Well, were they thinking, I'm going to plant an apple tree because I want to make cider? Maybe, but probably more likely thinking, how are we going to survive? How are we going to bring food to the table? And then there's the other piece that was going on during wartime in that area is that if you made alcohol, you could use it as a commodity. Perhaps you were selling to the Germans, you could get information from the Germans and then bring it over to the Allied forces. And then what did you do with the cider and calvados on your property? Some farmers, it was known that they were burying their barrels underground along with their their silverware or family heirlooms, uh, just hoping that nobody would find it. There were so many things that we don't quite know or can we ever understand that impact. However, there are ways that that impact does kind of trickle through our cider culture. And if you are aware of it and notice it, I feel it will inform you as a consumer of cider, as a historian of cider, and as a citizen of the world in respect to each other and what we're all going through just to kind of make it from day to day. Uh, one of those key ways that n now, you know, it didn't really stand out, but it stands out more and more. And I, I refer to this often as when Jerome DuPont doing his, his cider chat episode, I'll put a link in the show notes to that when he mentioned, you know, look to the apples that you have. Uh, he's not saying that because he's like, hey, you know, stay away from our apples. They're like the best in the world. And, you, you know, you folks, wherever you are, New Zealand or America or Chile, you, you can't you, you can't do it. It's not that I mean, they had to, like, come up out of the ashes and use the apples that they had, albeit they were really fine apples to begin with. But they know what it is like starting from scratch. Uh, and frankly, when you think about it, that it's kind of like, well, yeah, you know, we, we need to stop being so whiny. Like, oh, we don't have the best apples. <laughs> oh my God, we just had prohibition. We did not have World War II coming through our property. We could deal with this, and we will, because we are amazing as a, a human race around the world. There's also a certain quietness that I experience in Normandy that is rather unique to the cider culture. It's a little bit downplayed, um, not so flashy, not so kind of basically in your face as I see it in the U.S. culture. Uh, 
and you think like, well, you know, why, you know, come on, come on, come on, you know, shout it from the mountaintops. And certainly I, I like doing that for every side of culture around the world, but perhaps that is because they had to kind of pull back a little bit and it's a lot to be occupied by a country. Um, it is a lot one can only imagine. So that's the second part. And the third part is a steeped tradition. You know, in like Brittany, they drink cider out of a bole. It's like a teacup. In Normandy, it's going to be more classically of glassware. And then there's the other principles of how cider is defined. You know, they do 100% apple. They have Calvados, which is what we would call apple brandy. They have Pamo, which is a blend of Calvados and cider. And these are their trade names, and they own it. And as such, Ciderville, we should respect that. When I see American makers using the descriptor Pomo, it's a little bit inconscionable to me because I see it as stepping on another country's tradition, their namesake, something that they created. And it takes away our own creativity when we can't think out of the box and find our own traditions. Uh, do we glean from other traditions? Yes, of course we do, because the U.S. is a melting pot. That's one of our best features. However, taking from another country and their traditions that they fought so hard to preserve uh, is not does not shine us in the best of light by any means. So that's another part. It informs us. It informs us of why they want to serve it a certain way, why they want to enjoy it a certain way. All these parts... Which brings me to this featured piece on our visit to an American cemetery in Normandy on last year's Totally Sighted Tour. Uh, you're going to be hearing from the superintendent who brought us on the visit. We're actually at the uh, Brittany American Cemetery, which is not in Brittany. It's uh, right on the border of Brittany and uh, Normandy. It was a rather moving experience. I mean, why go on a cider tour and then go to a cemetery? Well... If you've been listening up to this point, you know now it's because it informs us of the culture. What is in our glass is only one part of the story. The much larger part of the story are the people behind it, the society, the culture that is there. Uh, so I'm going to let this story kind of unfold. Uh, we have gotten off of the bus the night before we are out by Mont Saint Michel. We are halfway through our tour now, which was a good time to go on this piece because it, it's no doubt somber to walk into a military cemetery and see so many grave sites for men who died in battle on a foreign land uh, to fight in World War II. I, I can't say enough about the group that I was with. It was really the perfect timing to be halfway through the tour. We had melded together and to walk with that group in there, it, it felt so right. And though it was a somber experience, and you wouldn't think, well, why do you want to do that on a holiday when you're going for cider tours? I have to admit, it was also one thing that people said they really were happy that we were doing. It was something that felt that we should do uh, in tribute to not only the Allied forces of World War II and the Americans that we were connected to one way or the other, but for Normandy uh, overall, that they survived, they were moving forward, and they had created beauty out of so much, so much horrendous horror. Let's all grab a glass and raise it high to those who do fight the good fight and those who gave their lives to keep us all free around the world and to the makers and the producers who rose up out of the ashes, and brought us Normandy today. We're headed now to the Brittany American Cemetery, based on the border of Brittany and Normandy, and it is run by the American Battle Monuments Commission. I'm the superintendent. That's my title here. Um, I'm the I'm the guy that's responsible for the site. The American Battle Monuments Commission, who I work for is a small agency under the executive branch of government. We have about 450, 500 people employed. And, uh, and we take care of just our federal monuments 
and cemeteries outside the continental United States. Here at this site, I've got the responsibility for this cemetery and then the monument that's about three hours from here in Brest, which is from the First World War. The American Battle Monuments Commission was created in 1923 um, at the demand of uh, the government because they didn't know what we were going to do with all of our, our war dead. The sites are uh, protected. The, any, all the trees here, all of the hedges here, all of the grass here is exactly way, the way it was when it was constructed, as well as for our World War I cemeteries. Why is that important? Because we don't want to change our history. Um, so what you see is what you get, and it's the Commission of Fine Arts. Anytime we do any construction on site, mm. we have to go back to them and ask for permission. So anything we do here, the horticulture, if we, you're going to see a tremendous thing that we're doing there. We had to get permission before we, uh, we uh, cut down all these trees that were alignment trees. I ask you, how long have you been working here? I've been working here for uh, over a year, just over a year. Over a year. But I've been, I, I've also been, uh, I've been with the commission since, uh, since the year, uh, nine, well, almost 20 years. Almost 20 years. Yeah. And what's your name? Dave Bedford. Right. No, Thank you, Dave. <laughs> I am recording. <laughs> yeah, I sh I'm supposed to say my name, but That's I'm okay. the American on site. There's only one of us. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there's a whole bunch of us yeah. 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 on site. Yeah. We're on site now. On site. Yeah. But I'm the one that works here. All right. Let's go. Yeah. Thank Let's you. Let's go wandering. Yeah. We're not getting paid. For you. <laughs> Good point. But I, think, but I do think we're paying. So are you? Are you okay? <laughs> right. yeah. Once upon a time, I was in the army. Yeah. So where did you start? Where did you start off working? I've been in the Ardennes. I've been at eight different sites. I just came last year from our largest cemetery in in Europe, uh, the Meuse Argonne. Uh -huh. And uh, this is a transition for me. And next year I'll be retired at this time. Maybe I'll be guiding you guys. <laughs> <laughs> where's your, Where's Pamela? <laughs> Pamela, I'm here. <laughs> you need a guide? <laughs> but I specifically. I had no interest whatsoever in any of this until I joined the commission and I realized after uh, the first day on the job that these cemeteries are more than grass and, uh, and, uh, and hedges and trees, but they're about who, and you can see the headstones out there, it's about those guys buried out there and about their individual stories. We have 4,408 graves here and uh, each one represents a little bit more than just a, you know, just a, sure. a piece of marble. I always like to stop here because it's, it's evident we're going into the cemetery site. We have the chapel, which is the first, uh, the first stop and, uh, and museum, we call it. But we also have the statue. I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And as one of the priests you told me, that comes from St. Paul, of course. The majority of people that visit the cemetery are not Americans. It is usually the French. The French have not forgotten World War II. They continually come here. They continually pay, uh, pay their respects because of the fact that they had an experience we as Americans have never had. And that is somebody sitting on your head and saying, no, you can't go there. No, you, this is where you're going to buy your bread. No, this is what you're going to do for a living. In other words, the oppression of the Nazi regime in the German government during World War II. Um, we as Americans just don't understand that. I'll say that with that un unconditional resolve. Um, unless, you can't, unless you were here in Europe, your family was here in Europe, you don't have that same perspective. My mother-in-law, my wife is French, um, my mother-in-law talked about it until the day she died. As we, and that is the same phenomena that happens with the folks coming here. They come here to pay respect for those that gave their lives away from their country um, and they just they're incredibly indebted and that's something that just to, for me and hopefully you'll get out if you get out into the French communities especially around Normandy here um, where the where the fight was tremendous uh, you'll you'll get that feeling from the from from the French that you know wow I, you know we really appreciate what you've done that's starting to slip away and as the generations pass, and that's what they're concerned with, and they bring their families here. So their great grandchildren are the great grandchildren of those that experienced the war, and the grandchildren, um, and the children heard the stories as I had. The statue is, of course, we anglicize things in the United States. We speak a common language with the English. 
and that would be the, re the, the figure of St. George, primarily because he's on a horse, and St. George does what? He combats evil in the, in the, in the Western philosophy. For the French, I'd go, you know, when I asked the French that question, thinking, wondering how much they know about the uh, uh, English culture, they think, no, that's something close to here, Mont Saint-Michel. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you visited that yet. You probably will visit it, right? No. Yesterday. 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 So that, for them, minus the horse, <laughs> yeah, would be, right. of course, the Archangel Michael. Um, I fought a good fight. I finished my course and I've kept the faith. And when I ask that, I, I start into this philosophy. I've kept the faith. What does that mean, I've kept the faith? And we're talking specifically about these American, these young American youth fighting evil. Given the full measure, they've died in combat. Uh, the comrade in arms concept, it comes from, uh, from uh, Saving Private Ryan and then a Band of Brothers and that. I think there's a mix. I think there's a lot of uh, considerations in there. And one of the conceptions that we have about uh, keeping the faith is that these are all gallant volunteers going off to war. Is that true? What percentage of those out there buried in the cemetery, and this pretty much is, the cemetery is not unlike others, so you can pr apply the percentages right across the board. Um, what percentage of those out there are volunteers versus draftees? What do you think? 20%. 20% volunteers? Mm -hmm. Yes. No, I'd say 80%. I, I, I think so too. Your 20% is pretty close, really? I think. Yeah. <laughs> I know how many, how many draftees are out there. The draftees are 72%. Wow. Okay. And that, the reason I know that is because we have their serial numbers and the serial numbers in and of themselves tell a story. Um, and you'll see that when we go out into the plots. Because they have, well, you'll see that when we go out into the plots. So you think about the fact that these guys are draftees, they really don't want a part of this, this situation. They're called into service with the military and they end up coming over here and losing their lives, okay? Um, I'll, I'll put it like that, they lost their lives. They, don't, they didn't willingly give their lives. No, no one is, is crazy to say, I'm just gonna jump on, jump on this hand grenade every day. Um, although that certainly, uh, that circumstance certainly may have happened. Let's go, uh, go ahead and walk through. We entered St. James Cemetery and we are being escorted around by the superintendent of the cemetery. It's really the largest American cemetery, I think, next to Omaha in Normandy. You enter a gate, you walk along a, a tarred road, you come to this massive statue of what David was saying is a, a man on a horse slaying a serpent and it has other other gestures or other connotations for Americans, but it's all about slaying evil. I'm down with that. focus about who we are as Americans, who we were as Americans. Um, so, and I think there's pretty good, a pretty darn good cross-section here. Um, the cemetery, this is the only cemetery that is constructed in the shape of something. Usually they're just laid out plots, you know, eight, ten plots, square, rectangular, or in an arc potentially like Cambridge. But this is a, done in an in a bit of an arc, as you can see, the headstones are aligned, but they seem to have a flare off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have a central alley, most, uh, most of our sites do. We have a chapel, but it may not be placed strategically, and then we have the walls we're missing, which are down below on either side. And that is the shape of that patch right up there, which is the shape patch, or shape, shape at the time. Strategic Headquarters Allied Forces Europe. 
that was Eisenhower's patch. This is the only cemetery that we maintain outside the continental the United States that has a form of something. So really for Eisenhower, this is an important, could be an important site. Um, in other words, they had the flame, the handguard, the uh, handguard being walls of the missing, the, uh, the handle itself, of course, the chapel, the epi or, uh, or the, uh, the lamb, the, the blade is down through the center with the point is that cenotaph down there. And then the flame, of course, is, uh, is the, uh, are the headstones. Are, are, you, are, are you talking about the patch? What are you referring the to? The patch the right in the center of the uh, right, stained right, glass. Right, right the stained glass, so yeah, we can't right. see it totally bright, but no. there's a, so there's a flame and yeah. all that. Okay, thank you. So, so those would be patches on the arms. That'd be the patch that they'd wear on their, uh, on their left shoulder. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. Okay, what do you think? Is this the... Uh, is this the United States of America or is it France? Is this the, the land US is given is to us for perpetuity for use oh. as a cemetery. The land is France. And that is something that the French like to come here and say this is America. It is our American taxpayers' dollars that um, pay for all of the uh, all of the maintenance, all of the vehicles, all of the salaries, everything like that. We do not accept any money from anyone else. And that's a big thing because we're doing interpretive centers like our national parks have at many of our sites and uh, the host country wants to give money to us and once they take money from somebody guess what they've got a vested interest they got to say and they want to do what they want to do and we say mm, this is what we want to tell the world who we are about the Americans do you pay taxes on land no. no we pay no taxes in fact when we buy vehicles and that sort of thing uh, we, any of the durable goods or anything like that, we, we pay no taxes on. Uh, we follow French law as far as the workers are concerned, um, so that they're covered by the French social security systems and that sort of thing. I'm covered by the Americans, which is kind of weird. I get paid in dollars, they get paid in euros. Are you the only American working here? I'm the only here? American here. All of our American cemeteries have one American at them at least. Mm -hmm. and, and it's all, all men. All, all men here. All men. Um, when at the end of World War One, and I'll start. I got to go back to World War One. They decided that they would we would do burials overseas. It was rather a touchy subject because we didn't know what we wanted to do. There was a part of the part of the government that wanted to, uh, primarily re led by Teddy uh, by uh, Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt, and he felt that we should all that everyone should be buried in the field of honor, the field of battle regardless, no choice, as the Commonwealth has done. The Commonwealth, the British, uh, Canadians, uh, and, and everyone's part of the Commonwealth, they had no choice. They're buried in the field of mm -hmm. battle if they died during, uh, during the, either, well, the wars. Um, and what did the Americans do? Well, we had two sides. Secretary of War Baker said that during World War I said, we'll bring them home, all of them home. And that's a, that was a potential. Um, there was controversy with the American funeral directors because of the fact that they said, oh, we can bring them back. Uh, um, the funeral, sorry if yep. you're in the funeral business, yeah. but uh, back then they said, well, make them look like they were when they left. Mm. They'd been buried in dirt for four years. Yes. Not a possibility. But those things, uh, they took out big, uh, big, big press uh, releases and everything in the papers <laughs> throughout the country stating that. that is so mm -hmm. at the end, in, in the end, what we ended up doing is we ended up petitioning every family in World War I and we would, we would continue that tradition and the families had the choice at their own expense to bring them all the way home. If they went back to the United States, usually they went home. They did not always go to... Um, the national cemeteries. I think we've got 124, 126 right. in the states. Um, they did not go there normally, okay, as a rule. So what percentage? About 40% would choose to have their loved ones buried and remembered here in our, our cemeteries outside the United States, and 60% would go back to the United States. So, so it was at their own expense that American families had to bring... No, no, no. no? The federal I did, government... I that wrong. 100%. 100%. Yeah, all the way to the door. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So and of course, the funeral directors would get paid for their services once they got once they got into the hometown. You know, the right, federal government right, reimburse right. them. So. Oh. So when you said that, uh, so it's a 60-40 split in terms of who stayed and who yes. went. Okay. So 
you have how many people here? Four, uh, 4,408 tombstones. So were there 60% more people who were sent back? Yes. So we have about, about 10,000 10, folks yeah. who, who perished in this, exactly. in this area, in, this, in that time period. Yeah. Or in Out Rogers. to Brittany and then all heading towards Paris and then also south of saint Lo. Some of the temporary cemeteries would be divided between us and the beaches, the Normandy beaches, uh, the, the uh, one at uh, Colville. So, and we don't know how that all happened. We uh -huh. don't. There's certain things we just don't understand here, also. Uh huh. Um, in our history, it's not written down. Why did they make the decisions that they did? Maybe it's somewhere in the papers in the archives, but we haven't been able to. Uh -huh. so we encourage people to walk on the land, the grass here in Normandy. They may not because. Normandy has over a, over a million <coughs> visitors a year, and it's just a, it's really hard to work on. Mm. Work that mm. All of our headstones have the have similar information, and the one I'll talk about is uh, this gentleman right here. This is, of course, one of our 81 Stars of David. Are there more Jews in the cemetery? This is the other question. Mm. World War II. Did you want to be Jewish and be in the army at that time? Damn right. Watch out. Yeah. <laughs> if you were taken prisoner, you were not going to make it too lo too long with uh, with what was going on in Europe and the Nazi re under the Nazi regime. Every headstone has their name, their rank. This one, David Gr David El Gross, captain, his unit or part of his unit, because on the stars of David we can't put the complete unit off it, uh, just because of space. The state where they entered the military, mm. which is not necessarily where they're from, mm -hmm. and then the date of their death. We do not have their birth date on here. Mm. And one other very important thing that they have on, a, on the headstone that we don't, mm. isn't on this side, the back has their serial number. And mm. the serial number tells another story. Mm. This one has a, a zero, it looks like it's actually, an, oh, he's an officer. David Gross was a was a, a, a Jewish kid growing up in uh, in Nashville. From the research that we've done, he didn't uh, he didn't have a father. He, uh, he his mother lived with a with a friend of hers, and they uh, they ran a um, they ran a, a department store that sort of thing. And uh, when when war broke out, what's the dream back then? Maybe our generation want to be astronauts. They wanted to fly. So many of them joined uh, the, uh, Air Corps. the Air Corps, yeah. as David Gross did, and he was skilled enough to become a fighter pilot. He fought, uh, his date of death is the 6th of August. The Germans were assembling for this counterattack at that point. He was sent out to, to take out a, um, uh, some tanks. He was in the 9th Air Force, which means that they lived here in France. Their, their, uh, their air base was always brought forward and always, it wasn't as luxurious as, as those that would be permanently based in England. And he lived in field conditions. And that's a picture of him, if you see hmm. there. Yeah. Um, good looking guy. Yeah. Uh, and he went in, hit the, hit the tanks came back around, saw another target of opportunity, and lost control of his aircraft, and it spread over about 300 yards um, when it crashed. He was buried, uh, his body was recovered, and he'd be eventually temporarily temporarily buried uh, in the saint Hilaire area. Um, and of course then, the process of waiting, the grieving of the parents. Why do we have only 40% here? What were the reasons that his mom wanted him buried here? Because of the comradeship, we don't know. Those are those are really individual uh, and very personal questions. Because some said we didn't trust the government. I've had families say that. Um, some said no because of the loyalty to the country and because these are his, you know, his brothers in arms. So uh, we think about that and 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 think, okay, you know, who was this young man uh, uh, willing to apparently give his life for his country and his beliefs? And he had Jewish on his dog tags. Had he been captured, uh, wouldn't have been a good day either. So um, we think about that. Back then, we, you know, uh, our country was a divided country. Segregation. Uh, David Gross was not allowed to join certain clubs. Uh, that's something that hopefully will eventually abate in the United States. That segregation. But um, that segregation back in, the, in World War II was the norm. And that's, let's talk about this headstone right here. What do we think about when we talk about segregation? 
immediately African Americans, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. Samuel Peterson is one of uh, 31 African Americans buried here. And he's just in the plot wherever he ended up. We don't know the reason. We know that there is no, except in uh, certain cases, there's no rhyme or reason as to why they're buried where they are. So they're not done by their divisions or not groups? Not by or divisions, any? ranks, uh, race, or anything like that. Mm. Good. Because in World War I, we started the tradition of desegregating, racial desegregation. And we don't know why. We'll be honest with you. We don't know why. Um, we know that that happened in World War One. If the guys in World War One uh, were repatriated to Arlington, they're all buried. The African Americans are buried in Plot 19. Mm -hmm. And that freaked me out when I started doing the research because you know I was oh, I was at the World War One site. I was at the largest cemetery, mm -hmm. and and then uh, and and it was really a kind of a interesting situation. But we don't know why, but we are probably the first government organization that desegregated. World War One and World War Two, and then in Korea, we would have uh, we would desegregate it officially at that time, and it would be the United States Army that did that. So Samuel A. Peterson, he died. Uh, he was a private. He was. If you look at the number at the back, his number starts with a three. Ones, twos, and sixes are volunteers. The twos and the sixes are National Guard. The ones are are uh, are. The ones and twos are volunteers, sixes are National Guards, um, threes and fours, which make up 72% of the, these guys buried out here, are draftees. Hmm. Now, that's, there's a little bit of a falsity in that. You could also volunteer for the draft. In other words, okay, take me. <laughs> right. So, right. as in Vietnam, as right. in Korea, uh, right. you could always volunteer. Right. Um, so, Samuel Peterson would be drafted. Uh, put into an anti-aircraft battalion. He uh, came from North Carolina, in fact, Charlotte, and then he died, on, we know his date of death. Um, we know that he was, this is his draft card, and it talks about where he's from. He was unemployed at the time, living in Charlotte. Uh, African American, of course, is on the back. Um, he didn't get the Purple Heart, though. And out of the 31 uh, African American spirit here, I think only about five or six had the Purple Heart. The Purple Heart is the award you get if you're killed in combat or if you uh, die in combat. But he didn't get it, so he probably died in an accident, somehow, some way. Um, African Americans were segregated into usually support units. Right. This anti-aircraft unit was a support unit for probably the Army, uh, one of the Army. Interesting. Um, and they would have been led by one likely white officer. So, so we have that aspect, desegregated, yet treated equal in death um, in our American Battle Monument Cemetery. Why was an anti-aircraft uh, unit considered a support unit? They had a core artillery also. Artillery units would be support. Really? Yeah. yeah. And they did have a, I know World War I, we had whole infantry divisions, what we call infantry divisions, that were African American, and we did in World War II. Right. But they were not in the European theater, they were in the Mediterranean theater. Uh -huh. So, in this, do you see any order? Okay, we talked about it, there really isn't. Baudouin is next to Peterson, uh, next to Burroughs, but there actually is, are burials that do have order, side-by-side -side burials. Let's go mm. look at side-by-sides. We don't let, we're not letting you go out and drink coffee. You have to keep me on time. But we drink cider and poire this week. That's right. <laughs> That's what we're doing. No coffee. <laughs> you tell them, Pamela. Yeah, I <laughs> so we're walking across the St. James Cemetery, just filled with white crosses, uh, like a ivory color. And uh, the Jewish members of the military have not a cross, but the Star of David. Two brothers. That's the exception for being uh, um, Azar, uh, Parazar, who just spread all over the place without any random. We got two brothers. We got a friend. Uh, we are not going to be able to get to them, but there's also a crew, aviation crew, that the families wanted them buried side by side. Far, Otis Far and uh, Otis Far and George Far. The younger. I want to join the war. I want to fly airplanes. I want to get involved. And the older 
who was married and didn't want any part of this. And you notice one's from Illinois, that's the home of them, and then the notice, uh, or Otto rather, uh, would, would, with his wife, move to uh, St. Louis. St. Louis, yeah. exactly, for jobs. Yeah. Didn't want any part of it, neither, uh, he didn't want any part of it. You look at, he, he became an officer, volunteered, and of course there's a three on his, uh, on the back of his headstone. No thank you, I'm married, I have a job, I have a real you know, responsibility to a family. Um, I don't want any part of this. But what, what the two families would do, well, the family would get together, the wife, the widow, um, and, the, and the mother, and they decided that they would have them buried side by side here. Second generation, Far, F-A-H-R. And this is something that I explain to uh, the Europeans on a regular basis, especially the French. I say, where do the Americans come from? And of course, the quick answer is America. But do we really come from America? How many Native yeah. Americans do we have here? Or Ameri American Indians do we have? Not many. None. None are here today. Okay. If you didn't, if you were a Native American or a slave brought there in chains, then you probably went in in some fashion, way, shape, or form uh, to the United States, like my family did, um, like all American families did. We have that common Western root, and that's one of the reasons why. They, World War One or World War Two? Why did you come? Why did you, you come here? Well, it's because the part, the part, we're part of Western society, and Western society is Europe. So we have a debt. We have a debt to Lafayette that we uh, we have, we attempt to pay in the, in the freedom of the United States of America. The Fars came also. Their grandparents were German. Yeah. So um, we, un I think, uh, we as Americans understand that debt, and hopefully, uh, as we look at the 21st century, that we understand our, our responsibilities in the world in a, in a, in a manner that uh, is in keeping with, uh, I think, the origin of our country, um, but also in the, in the respect of, uh, of, of what it means to sacrifice, be, have your country sacrifice you for the, for the cost of freedom. And, uh, and that's what the French come here, and they understand that. They want to understand that. They want to touch this. They want to touch this headstone and think about um, about somebody dying for them, uh, which is an incredible, uh, incredible thing. Yeah, it is an incredible thing to take in the magnitude of World War II, to take in the landscape of Normandy, of Western Europe, and to salute the history that has gotten us to our present day. Uh, quite a privilege indeed, and an honor for me to be able to set up the Tolly Cider Tour for the group last year to go to the Brittany American Cemetery, also known as the St. James Cemetery. This year, when we return again to Normandy this coming September on the Totally Cider Tour, we'll be visiting Omaha Beach. Uh, we'll be en route to Mont St. Michel, but stopping at Omaha Beach. And uh, I can only imagine, at, at the St. James Cemetery, there's 4,408 grave sites. At Omaha Beach, there are uh, nearly 10,000. Uh, I'm hoping that you get a sense of why I am doing this and how it informs me as someone who uses this podcast and this forum to educate all of us on cider. Um, on that same journey too, of course, and to step out of the glass sometimes and look at the historical perspective, to understand the culture, to get a deeper appreciation for the people. Uh, it's, it's the beauty of our world is that there's just so many unique territories, so many unique regions where people are working with apples and pears, and each one has a certain tradition, a certain quality to it, and in Normandy, France, it's very unique um, from my perspective because there's nowhere else in the world that I know of that so many of us uh, come together and we have this common, 
commonality. There were 20 nations in the Allied forces, 20 nations that were involved in uh, working together at some kind of scope to fight Germany and the Nazi occupation. Uh, Of course, there was also a whole Pacific theater happening too. So it was a huge, huge war. We're only looking at 75 years ago. Think about that in terms of an apple tree 75 years ago. So, uh, wow, huh? Ooh, uh, yeah. And with that, I'd like to just really encourage you, if perhaps you can't make it to Normandy this year, but there might be someone in your life, a friend or family member, who would be interested to travel to Normandy to experience that other piece of not just cider, but the sights and sounds. We're going to be at Omaha Beach, and we're also going to be going uh, earlier in the tour to Etrat, which has a beautiful site, but was also occupied during World War II. And to delve into that scene, I have a sense that this particular tour is going to be bringing us even deeper into the Norman landscape and the French people. And in turn, for me, Siderville, that gives me a deeper appreciation for the producers, the orchardists, and the people behind the cider in my glass. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the street, smelling all the blossoms, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. You could find info on the Totally Cider Tour to Normandy, France by going to the Totally Cider page at ciderchat.com. This is Rhea Windcaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. <laughs> some